All right, let's move on to Southwest. So we've made a lot of progress there, obviously, um, but there are some things that were set back. Um, that low water crossing, can you explain why that was delayed and what happened there? You know, the, there, was, there were a number of delays on that low water crossing. Mm -hmm. We do all the due diligence that we can whenever we go into the design process of a street. And, you know, the, the, the crutch of the matter is, is we don't know what is underground necessarily. We have a really good idea in a lot of cases, but unfortunately, you don't always know what's been placed there or exactly where it is or what's going to happen. So we saw that on that low water crossing of Southwest, you know, when by, we by McDonald's, if by anyone McDonald's. doesn't know that. So, <laughs> yes. <yeah. laughs> if anyone, yeah. Um, you know, when we started digging and excavating, we came across a gas line that was just in the wrong place. We, we didn't anticipate it being there and we completely had to work with that, you know, Atmos and that franchise utility to move that and, we're kind of at their mercy to, to work with us in that. And they're really good about doing it and, and reprioritizing to, so that our project can keep going. But that created a, del a delay. So let me, let me stop you real quick. So when you find other company utilities, the city or the contractor cannot move it. It is up to that, con that company to move that. So that's you have right. to wait on them like you We said. do not touch them. Um, and in fact, it's, you know, that's a part of, so we, we have, I use the word franchise utility. So they pay for a franchise with the city, meaning they have the right to come in and use our right of way um, to put their infrastructure in. So Atmos, AEP, Contra Valley Electric, you know, they all have franchise utilities with us. Part of that agreement is they have to come in and move that if we're doing a streets project that, it, and we need it moved out of our way. That's part of their responsibility in that franchise. So they have to come in and they move it. We're not going to touch it. Just like if you have a tree growing into the, the high line, we're not going to come trim that tree. We're going to get Sudden Link or a, AEP or whomever to come trim that tree. Um, we play the liaison for those communications, but um, ultimately it's their infrastructure. It's their responsibility, and, and we don't want to touch it. We don't want to get into that. We're not gas people. You know, we're not imagine, electric people. I'd imagine moving a gas line is not as simple as just making cuts, moving it, and, and reassembling it, and no, there's a lot that goes into that. you're talking about pressures, and yeah, it's, and hazard. I mean, it, yeah. it's explosive, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's what gas is, so we don't want to touch it. We're not trained in that. Yeah. Um, we do water, sewer, streets. We don't do gas. We don't do electric. You don't we want don't us do to fiber. touch it. That's not what we're <laughs> that's what not, Yeah, you yeah. don't want us touching that. Yeah. So. so when they found that, um, that messed with the elevation of the new street. Is that right? And so that, that kind of, you'll have to go back to the drawing board to figure out the design of the level of the street. Is that right? Uh, it moved the elevation of the boxes, the box culverts that go under the street, which ultimately are a fixed distance and they move the, the elevation of the street, which has a compounding effect all the way through the, through that particular area. So, yeah, I mean, and, and that's, Again, what you see with every project is kind of that that you need some flexibility there and you need some ability to, to make some decisions in the field. Everything can look good on paper, but ultimately until you get in the field and you get it torn up and you and you start looking at it and put your hands on it, that's when, you know, the rubber meets the road, if you will, and it it you have to make those decisions that work amongst everything. And we can't just bully, uh, you know, a franchise utility into something. It's we have to coordinate and we have to work with them. So you know, they they have their constraints and we have our constraints, and usually we compromise and come up with a workable solution for everybody. But yes, it did impact the elevations of that roadway, which impacted you know how we feather in and how we tie in to that particular crossing. But yeah, and again, you see that in every project that we come. It's a known unknown that we're going to come into come into contact with something like that in a project. How often do you guys do a, a street project and it goes completely 100% smooth with no surprises? Does that ever happen? <laughs> <laughs> no, it doesn't. Uh, you know, and I could, I could say, well, not since I've been doing it, but I don't know that since anyone's been doing it that that's been the case. Um, there's always stuff that you come across, and, you know, thankfully that's why you have intelligent people managing the projects and working on the project so that they can look at it, figure out the pros and the cons and the benefits and the, and the takeaways from 
each, you know, each option that's on the table and make the best decision on them. So that again, that's why we hire competent contractors and that's why we have engineering staff on board and, uh, with the city and we take all, it's not a knee jerk reaction. There's a lot of thinking that's involved whenever we do have to flex on a project because ultimately it does have repercussions all the way down the project. Um, you know, you can't just change an elevation without thinking about what what's that going to do to water flows? Is that going to now create a pond or create a hazard in this roadway? Is the water still going to continue to flow? What is it going to do? And is it going to back water up into somebody's property or, you know, and now affect cause a problem for somebody that didn't have a problem before? It's, there's a lot that goes into that decision making process. Well, that's I'm assuming that's why when you, you bid out a project and part of that budget is a contingency fund. Is this for things for un unforeseen things that you know all of a sudden are going to need something to pay for it in order yep. for the project to continue and move that, forward? That's exactly right. I mean, you miss quantities on the bid. And, you know, it's just a, it's the fact of the matter. It you know I can't get you down to the to the to the penny of what you know this particular thing is going to cost. But and then you come across the unknowns and you got to do something with them. You can't just expect the contractor to take care of it you know that it's their time it's their labor it's their expense and ultimately they should be compensated for that and that's what contingency is for it's for that part of the project that we don't know what's going to come up we know it's going to come up we just don't know what it is so something else that has impacted multiple of street projects is uh, manpower issues and then also you know supply issues can you talk about first like, let's, let's first talk about the supply issues you know when you're doing concrete on like southwest and bell street um, and getting some of the supplies that finish those projects, that, that's caused some of the delays. Can you talk about the yeah, ins and outs of that? And I, I, I hate going in there because it almost sounds cliche now. Oh, well, you have supply issues. It's, it just seems like that's the norm and that's the go-to response. But it's true. Uh, we do. It's, and it's beyond our control. You know, whenever uh, Ingram has a cement issue, we can't get concrete at that time. If we can't get concrete, the, the project can't move forward. I mean, it has to be sequential. It has to be phased in. Um, and it, it's a delay, and it's beyond our control. I mean, we can thump the table as much as the city wants to, but ultimately, if the supply of cement's not there to produce the concrete that goes in the road, there's nothing we can do about it. Uh, you know, we're relying on those plants to, to uh, provide that raw material so that we can ultimately get the end product that we need. Um, Labor issues are obviously the norm. COVID, you know, kicked us pretty hard as it did everybody. Um, we see those labor issues not only internally but with our contractors. And so while it sounds like a, like an excuse, it's not. It's reality. Um, and we, again, have to have that flexibility. And that's why we have terms of a contract that say Bell Street's going to take four years for real. And, yeah, it's because of these things that are we know are going to happen Granted, we could have never predicted that it would have impacted us, you know, at the extent that it did these past two years. But um, we know that there's going to be delays and things that happen um, that's beyond our control. And supply issues are one of those. How many, when it comes to manpower, um, and this may be too down in the weeds, but how many, how many people does it take to do a concrete section? Like, it's not just the three of us. It's a, a whole crew of people on the ground in the truck doing a number of different things at once. And if one of those people is missing, I'm assuming it's hard to find a replacement. To well, yeah, it, it slows down and you can't just, a lot of those are, are skilled labor. You can't just grab a guy off the street and say, go finish concrete. It's a, it's a skill that goes along with that to make that smooth. Cause uh, you know, you've all, I'm sure everyone's seen that portion of a concrete slab that holds water whenever it rains. Mm -hmm. Well, it's because there's a dip in that concrete. Well, to keep that dip out of there is a, it takes skill and um, why it looks, it may look like a very rudimentary process and a very easy thing to do from the, you know, Joe Citizen driving by. There's a lot that goes into it and there's a lot that goes into not only just making it flat and smooth, but then making sure that it cures the right way so that it doesn't crack and it doesn't um, have a structural issue as it moves on. Concrete's not done when it hits the ground. It, for the next 28 days, that concrete's live and it's and it's curing out and it's getting harder and um, 
even beyond that, I mean, for really for the next year or so, concrete is truly curing. Um, it's structurally sound in that 28 days or even a little quicker if you use the right right stuff. But um, yeah, if, if that one guy is moving or, or is missing and or the driver doesn't show up at the concrete company and that's the thing i mean it's you have a concrete you have a contractor that we're working with they have a subcontractor who is a concrete finishing crew who is ordering concrete from a different company who is using a different company to deliver their raw materials and so you know while we say it's a city project there's umpteen different entities involved in that to ultimately get us concrete or asphalt that we can put on the ground and uh you know e each business has its own priorities and its own controls and we don't necessarily we can't necessarily control that so i heard you say the word curing several times um we saw that with southwest and i live over by there so i, I saw it as well um you have the curing of the concrete that people drive on but i think what a lot of people experienced especially from that tractor supply to cavenders uh was the kind of the base of that just looking like dirt and sitting there for days. And I know we got several messages, you know, why isn't anyone working there? They haven't been working there for days. Can you explain that process and why it's important? And, and if, uh, if it rains on it, you have to start that process over. Is that, is that right? Right. And so that, you know, that's kind of the difficult thing about a lot of these projects is so much goes into what you can't see. Everyone sees the road that goes on top, but it's, that's, really the the last thing we should be that we're concerned about we can fix the road on top it's everything underneath that really makes or breaks a road and, and so whenever we design a project and you know in the case of southwest down there by the dealerships in hotel city it's that those soils there were unstable that material there didn't have a good structure to work in so what we do is we add in cement into that base structure to give it some more rigidity and, and provide a better base structure for that asphalt, which is flexible to sit onto. Um, if that if that base is flexing, asphalt flexes and it cracks and it breaks. And so we had to ensure that that base structure is sound. And there's different products you can use: cement, lime, uh, you know, liquid asphalt, just depending on the design and what you're trying to achieve there. Um, but that's that's exactly what you saw. So we incorporated cement into that base material. Well, it's just like letting a concrete slab harden up. We had to let that harden up. We couldn't put something on top of it that then sealed it up and didn't let that curing process happen because if, it, if we would have gotten on that and drove on that prior to um, that setting up and hardening, all we would have done is taken what would be a semi-rigid material and cracked it. And now we're no better off than what we were. We just wasted our money by putting in a material that didn't do anything for us. So we had to wait. We had to give it time. We had to let it cure out before we could drive equipment back on it again to actually lay the roadway. So it looks like we're just, you know, not working, but we're, we're working. We're just letting the material do the work for us. There's a process. Yes, there is a process. Gotcha.